uh, I start, uh, we have prepared a poll, okay, of a few questions so that we can get to know you and we will actually share the results uh, at, at the, uh, you know, at the end of the, um, at the end of the seminar as well. Um, so if, if I may request for uh, uh, Amber to actually uh, show the poll and please respond to the poll and we will actually, uh, you know, show you the results at the end of the talk. So let's take uh, maybe uh, uh, one or two minutes to do this, and then we will proceed with the presentation. Okay, for those of you who are just logging in, uh, please uh, respond to the poll. Uh, it's a way for us to, to know you. Uh, better and and also uh, we will show the results of the poll uh, at the end of the session. Okay. So Prof Go, we have about 76% um, that's completed poll one and two. So mm -hmm. we will move on to the second question, if it's okay. Okay, sure. Okay. Okay, we will share the results later. And this is a um, stage of um, digital transformation. Okay, let's just take another maybe 10 seconds and we'll move on to the next question. Okay, now we'll move on to the next question. All right, maybe the last 10 seconds. So again, for those of you who just came in, uh, we are doing a short poll right now, um, you know, to get to know you and to understand where you are in the transformation process. So please respond to the poll if you just came online. Okay. And the last question. And we'll show the results of this uh, at the end of the session. Maybe last five seconds. All right, thank you. Thank you, Prof Go. Okay, thanks, Amber.
Okay, so uh, I'm going to start now. Oops, okay. Uh, these are the results of the poll. Uh, uh, are we sharing now? The... Okay, so if you can see uh, which industry are you in, so uh, many of them from many people from services and then followed by uh, IT and technology and then uh, manufacturing slash engineering. Uh, not so many from retail and then somewhere in the middle on uh, public sector and I guess a lot of others um, you know maybe uh, you know we could we couldn't classify uh, that well but uh, a lot of people think that you are in in other categories probably about a fifth uh, of that okay uh, in terms of uh, vaccination uh, in the company so uh, majority at the executive level and then followed by managerial level and then uh, senior management uh, levels. Okay, so, so you can see it's a good mix. Let's look at uh, um, uh, what stage are you at? Okay, so uh, most companies or most, yeah, most companies are just starting, which is, uh, which is probably about right. I think we are at a stage when uh, all companies, basically big companies and uh, also the smaller ones and individuals as well are trying to figure out uh, what are our next steps and what we want to do uh, and what is actually digital transformation. Okay, all right, great. Yeah, so so all the above and actually in the presentation next, we'll run through all these different areas. And the last one will be the, yeah, yeah the main reason. Okay. Uh, okay, so most people identify lack of technical expertise. All right, so we have lots of training courses, lots of talks. So as uh, you know, as Amber mentioned earlier on, uh, the Smart Nation office is uh, creating a series of talks. Uh, we have uh, classes at NUS uh, as well, which you are, you we are welcome to take, and hopefully that helps in providing some of the uh, background knowledge. All right. Okay, so with that, um, let me uh, go into the presentation. Can you all see the screen? Okay, great. So uh, once again, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming on. Okay, so today we'll cover, uh, in the short time that we have, we'll cover uh, 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 digitalization impacts and then implications and we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A. And following that, uh, my colleague Marilyn will uh, also uh, come on board as well. All right. So if you look at the trend over the last uh, 20, 30 years, right, what we've seen, first of all, is that computing power has actually increased. So these are just two charts okay and there are many more charts like these okay that show band internet bandwidth increasing uh you know uh you know uh, uh internet penetration increasing etc okay but basically this is the 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 era of computerization which is actually the third industrial revolution and i'll give an example of that uh, uh you know of what that computerization uh, meant for companies but if you look at this, computing power has increased, storage uh, has increased, uh, bandwidth has increased, and that has led to massive amounts of data processing. That has led to uh, you know the information being stored in bits and bytes, okay, and you know rather than in analog. So in terms of our real, in terms of how that impacts our life, what does that mean? Okay, so if you look at examples of um, devices or services that we used to use, okay, of course a typewriter is very quaint these days, but I think many of us will still remember the days when we were able to use film, okay, a physical film, and, and we had to ration um, our um, film uh, because, you know, you only have 24 or 36, um, you know, film in, you know, that you can use before you have to change for the next one, right, and compared to what we have in the digital camera today. So, um, you can see that that is, uh, in a way, uh, impact of digitalization 
that is very much present in our lives. And of course, the post office. So we stop sending letters, right? We stop sending Christmas cards or New Year cards or birthday cards, okay? And we are sending e-cards or we are sending emails rather than letters. Okay, so, so this is uh, actually how digitalization has impacted our personal lives versus uh, the kind of analog technology. But this was only the start of that computerization. Okay, and this uh, actually has been happening over the last uh, 20, 30 years and accelerating into this, uh, into this decade. So let me give an example uh, that uh, many of us will be familiar with as well. Okay, and this is Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay, which, uh, you know, when many of us were growing up, we also, uh, you know, know that uh, it was a prestige symbol to have this encyclopedia in our living rooms, okay? So rather than put in in a room, okay, in our own uh, bedrooms, people put in the living room because they want to display that they bought a $1,000 uh, $1, set of encyclopedia, okay? And, and it was seen as uh, one thing to acknowledge. But if you look at the, the sales of Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, over the years, okay, the peak of Encyclopedia Britannica sales was in 1990, and thereafter, okay, the sales of Encyclopedia Britannica went down year after year, okay, until the uh, until it closed down, okay, in in uh, 20 uh, around the 2010 2011 period, okay, and and thereafter it it stopped the only uh, stopped the print version and only uh, basically went online. If you look at their decline, okay, the story of their decline, there were actually two uh, things that led to their decline. Okay. Um, the first thing that happened was that uh, the Microsoft introduced a, a CD-ROM encyclopedia. Okay, so they're selling the CD-ROM encyclopedia called Encarta and they're selling at $99. So a CD-ROM obviously can be updated much faster, okay? And, uh, you know, it is cheaper to print compared to a physical book copy. So that was the first uh, wave, right, of uh, impact or disruption to that uh, encyclopedia industry, okay? The second thing that happened was the rise of the internet, okay? As the internet became more prevalent and as bandwidth became easier to access, you find that, uh, you know, uh, new uh, business models like Google came along, Yahoo, Google, and then uh, Wikipedia, right? And all these were able to provide, in a way, uh, information for almost free. Okay, of course, they sell advertising, but you can go online to search on Wikipedia, you can go online to search on Google for your information very easily. Okay, so the internet actually enabled the search of this information uh, more easily, and this was the second impact. So you can see that over time, the sales of the encyclopedia went down. Okay, so and eventually they had to close down. Okay, so this business model no longer worked. And if you think about it, this was actually the era of uh, the era of that computerization, which we uh, which we call industry 3.0. So actually industry 4.0 is building on top of that. And I'll give an example of that in the next slide. Okay, but uh, you know, the computerization era actually started in the 80s. Okay, obviously it started in the 70s, but it started in the 80s, 90s with the use of PCs and the conversion of the information that we used to have on paper, okay, into digital form. And that allowed it to be processed. Okay, and, and therefore you can see that there is an impact, okay. But the good thing, but if you look at the trend itself, okay, with, with what happened with Encyclopedia Britannica, and even today uh, with what we see with e-commerce, uh, that trend of the decline of that transformation of that disruption took place over a 15, 20 year period. Okay, so it is not immediate that technology disruption comes in and then the sales drop and falls flat and then company goes out of business. Okay, between 1990 to, to 2010, okay, there's a 10 year, 20 year, there's a 20 year period, okay, before the, the encyclopedia business uh, went out, okay, went out of business, right? So technology disruption actually uh, doesn't happen overnight, okay? So the thing is that it happens in gradual stages, and this is also what we see with e-commerce. So today we know that e-commerce has disrupted retail, Okay, but that disruption uh, happened, you know, started from the 1990s 
until now when it has really accelerated with what we see with Amazon and Alibaba. All right, so same thing, uh, it, it takes place over a period of time, which means that, you know, companies may not realize it, that's one. But secondly, the good thing is also that companies do have time to respond, okay? And individuals do have time to respond because if we see the trend out there, it is not going to hit us immediately. It will hit us in a time to come. And therefore, uh, we as individuals or we as companies do have time to prepare for it. Okay, so this is the stages of industry uh, revolutions. Okay, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk so much about uh, the steam power and mass production. Okay, um, but you can see that uh, we built on top of the computerization. And today, when we talk about Industry 4.0, it is actually a confluence of different technologies coming together. Okay, uh, and you know, uh, even uh, what they call physical devices. So when they say talk about cyber physical systems, they talk about dev devices that are linked to internet. So internet of things, uh, robotics, you know, that are actually linked to the internet itself. And we're able to draw data from uh, these devices and to be able to process these devices and to be able to make predictions and to make uh, intelligent uh, solutions based on these devices. Okay, so let me show you a video clip. Okay, uh, this is Amazon Go convenience store. I'm, I'm just gonna start running and... Hi everyone, I'm Lexi Savides and I am in the middle of San Francisco's financial district standing right outside Amazon Go, the company's first cashierless store in this city, although it is store number six across the US with other ones in Chicago and Seattle. So this concept is all about cameras and sensors tracking what you're buying. So essentially all you do when you walk in the store is scan the app, you pick out what you want and then you just walk straight out and it's charged automatically. So I'm going to try it out. You're going to come with me. I have the app already loaded on my phone. So let's go inside and we are going to go on a bit of a shopping spree. I think it's going to be pretty fun. time inside an Amazon Go store so I don't really know what's going to be here. I think it's going to be, I can see like candies, chocolates, there are a couple mugs, cliff bars, gum. Let's grab some chocolate chips. Okay, so I'm going to grab some off the shelf and it's going to keep an eye on what I'm actually picking up and so it's going to add it to my cart and then if I put it back, it's going to take it out of my cart. It's like magic but I think I want the chocolate chips, why not? There's a lot to choose from in here. And there are a couple of, I've noticed a couple of local vendors that are just from San Francisco, like there's Munchery. And then over here, there are stuff from Dosa. So these are all just like San Francisco local brands that you're probably not gonna get anywhere else. So now I have everything I need. I have breakfast, lunch, and a really sugar-filled dinner. I'm gonna walk straight out with this and it's gonna send me an invoice afterwards. It's kind of weird. I don't have to talk to anyone. I don't have to scan my credit card. I'm just gonna leave. So I've just left the store and now I'm going to go into the app and it gives me an invoice of everything that I bought. Yeah, I went a little bit crazy, let's be honest, I bought some stuff. Got my grand total down here, my invoice and my card's been charged and, and that's it. I spent 10 minutes and 13 seconds in the store. Uh, I think I'm going to go back in and, and check it out even more because there's lots of stuff in there. This is a big store, so that was Amazon Go shopping experience. Okay, great. So if you look at this video, okay, what you can see is that there is no single technology which we can identify as uh, so-called what is an industry 4.0 technology. Okay, we are talking about different technologies coming together into this contactless store. So for example, you need to have uh, video cameras, okay, that do uh, recognition of the person. Or, and recognition of what products are carrying, okay? And then when they pull out the products, it actually needs to link back to their inventory management system to decrease off. It also needs to go to their e-wallet, right? And to make the e-payment, okay? And to detect that they have actually walked out of the store, uh, you know, so maybe some kind of uh, sensor, right? With, uh, to, to detect that uh, the products have actually left uh, the store, okay? So, so you're talking about sensors, you're talking about, 
uh, video cameras, okay, uh, some kind of AI to recognize what products are being taken out, uh, you know, uh, data uh, integration to backend IT systems, you know, to the warehouse management system, the retail system, to the point of sale system of a typical convenience store. So it's really an integration of different technologies coming together in order to make uh, you know, a, a, a contactless store like this work. All right. So industry wise will continue to blur. I'm going to run through several trends, okay? Uh, and uh, this, this is uh, an article from The Economist. And in this case, uh, this is talking about how uh, WeChat uh, and Alipay actually uh, disrupting the banks, okay? The financial services provider, okay? This is one of my favorite charts, okay? This shows the top uh, five uh, cloud infrastructure service providers, okay? And if you look at uh, this chart, the largest, uh, you know, the largest market share is uh, by Amazon. Okay, so if we think of Amazon as an e-commerce company, all right, uh, it, but at the same time, it's providing, you know, uh, cloud uh, computing services. So uh, basically uh, hosting services for data uh, and, and web, uh, website uh, storage, website data uh, hosting and web storage, uh, uh, data storage uh, hosting. Okay, and, and um, it's actually bigger than the so-called traditional IT companies like Microsoft and IBM and Google, okay? So, you know, if we think of Amazon as an e-commerce company, it is actually not just e-commerce anymore, right? So uh, Amazon Web Services, which is its cloud computing uh, business, is actually one of the most profitable and, uh, you know, one of the largest segments uh, behind uh, Amazon itself. Okay, so industry minds are blurring, okay? And companies are worried that technology companies will actually come and disrupt their um, traditional industry, okay? And again, if you look at this example, okay, uh, three years ago, Amazon purchased uh, one of the US uh, uh, grocery companies called Whole Foods, okay, uh, for 13.7 billion. So they spent a lot of money to buy into this grocery store, okay? But what was interesting was not that Amazon went into this segment, okay? Although they expanded into the physical retail, okay? But what was interesting was that when Amazon bought this uh, grocery chain, okay, the competitors of Whole Foods, meaning the other grocery stores, had their market value, okay, uh, reduced by twelve billion dollars. That means after Amazon announced that they're going to buy Whole Foods, uh, the the grocery industry in the U.S. lost around twelve billion dollars in market capitalization. All right. So what that means was that. People were worried that of what they call about the Amazon effect, okay, and you know, as a as a sort of code word, right? The Amazon effect or the Google effect basically means, you know, what if the technology player that is not in your traditional industry comes in into your industry and sort of uh, wipes out, okay, or takes away your existing business, okay, and you didn't even see that coming, okay. So the fear of disruption from uh, non-traditional competitors, right? And of course, traditional industries are also affected. So I've just shown you a couple of examples. This is uh, the first 3D printed drug, okay, that was approved by FDA uh, several years ago. And then uh, even in a very traditional business like agriculture, okay, in fact, the traditional businesses are the ones that are most ripe for, uh, most appropriate for, uh, you know, the use of uh, digitalization and transformation because they haven't done uh, much traditionally. Right, so it's really a way that um, uh, companies can actually make huge improvements. Okay, so in this case, they actually put uh, IoT devices in the cows, right, to monitor their temperature and, and their health of the cows. All right. So, um, but moving forward, right, what 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 and what what are the implication of this, right? Which is that with technology. If technology changes, certain experiences that we have, uh, you know, may may no longer be uh, useful. Okay, so so the uh, the example that I give here, right, is, uh, for example, uh, uh, you know, in in the past, uh, you know, driving a taxi in London, okay, which has a very very complicated road network, takes two years to pass the test, okay, before you can actually get 
a licensed drive a taxi in London. Okay, so it was actually physically shown, okay, uh, in scientific journals that the uh, the taxi drivers in London have got a bigger brain for memory because they're so used to driving around and memorizing the road network that uh, their memory function became stronger. Okay, so it was scientifically proven that they had bigger brains for memory. Okay, but fast forward to today, okay, the experience that you have, okay, that a person has in knowing the road network is less important, right? Anybody can be an Uber or Grab driver by using a GPS app. Okay, and we just follow the instructions. Okay, so I myself had this issue, right? When uh, when I was going to the dentist, okay, and and of course we seldom go to the dentist. So I, I was using the GPS to go to the dentist, okay, and when my phone died on me, I lost my way. <laughs> okay, because I'm so used to just following the instructions, turn left, turn right. Okay, I, I couldn't drive by myself. Okay, um, if it's a place that I'm not used to going. Right, but what, what that means is also saying that the experiences that we accumulate, if we are good at certain single task, uh, you know, for five years, 10 years, you know, 15 years, 20 years, you know, there's a possibility that those technologies can actually transplant what we have. Because, for example, in this case, the GPS app makes it so that you know you don't actually need to know have the experience of knowing the road network anymore, okay, compared to uh, what it was in the past. Right, so what does it mean for us? We also need to expand our experiences and our understanding of the business so that we are actually able to add value to the company, okay, rather than just focus on, uh, you know, a single uh, task, okay, or single processes, right? And of course, companies are not sitting still. So I just give a couple of examples, okay? Um, you know, the large companies are not sitting still. SME companies are also working on uh, you know, their uh, own digital transformation uh, project. So I just give a couple of examples here. And, and in this case, you have UPS, which is a logistics, a global logistics company trying to do 3D printing, okay? Because they anticipate the future may have less, uh, you know, transportation by air freight, you know, and uh, manufacture on the spot by 3D printing. Uh, the text here is a bit small, but you'll see Daimler and Bosch actually working together. So Daimler is obviously a big, a uh, car manufacturer that makes the Mercedes, okay, and they work together to create self-driving taxis in cities, All right? So big companies are also innovating. And uh, over here, um, I'm just going to show example of a Singapore company. So uh, when I was doing a... Wahab started as a one-man construction company over nine years ago, and today Wahab is one of the largest privately owned construction and civil engineering specialists. Wahab believes in continually adopting innovative technology to digitize and improve operations. Harbour products have been implemented successfully and has improved communication flow to boost our quality, safety and productivity in our city gate project. Wahab, we now gain real-time overview of our site and we can use this data to improve our business decision. I like using Harbour because it makes my work faster and more productive. My team find this app easy to use. It helps us monitor safety issues and ratify them quickly. using Hubble to conduct quality and safety checks on site to report issues on the go and manage the project in real time. Hubble has allowed us to reduce paperwork, improve communication and increase productivity. In the past, we have many forms to fill up and a lot of coordination required. But Hubble has allowed work to be completed much more quickly and easily. We are now confident technology has the ability to transform the construction industry from the way we collaborate to the way we build. Okay, so by the way, this was taken before COVID, right? So um, this, this was actually, I think, uh, done uh, one or two years back. Okay, but, uh, you know, but even now with COVID, with uh, limited resources, I think that, for example, the use of tracking and 
collaboration technology to actually coordinate uh, resources and to track the use of the uh, track materials and, and machinery uh, would, would be even more important. Okay, so you know, so initiatives like that are ongoing. Okay, and there are many other such examples. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, provide you with a couple of thoughts uh, at the end. Okay, um, you know, and, and here I, will, I, I put here two articles, right, that show two different perspectives. So uh, the first article is uh, Hitachi hires artificial intelligence bosses, okay, so AI bosses, right, for their warehouses. So the idea is that algorithms can allocate workers, okay, because algorithms are supposedly not, not so biased okay if if they are if they are given the right instructions okay they are neutral okay if given the right instructions so you use an ai algorithm to allocate workers all right and then the workers is basically following instructions from the computer all right in the second article okay uh, toyota says um you know we've done a lot of automation okay and and then we all know that japan is actually at the forefront of automation over the last uh, three decades Okay, Toyota says we've done a lot of automation, but we realize that, you know, you can only improve the process up to a certain level. At some point, you need a human input, okay, to understand what the business process is so that you can tell the robots what to do, okay? So automation is human powered because we want to use our knowledge of the business process in order to utilize technology better, okay? So if we ask ourselves which role we want to be, Okay, do we want to be the one that listens to the AI and the AI tells us what to do, where to go? Or do we want to be the one that understands the business process and therefore being able to manage the technology? So it doesn't mean that all of us have to be computer scientists. Okay, it doesn't mean that all of us have to be the one that manages, you know, that uses or creates technology. But we need to know how we can utilize tools in order to become more eff effective okay and and one big factor behind doing that is actually understanding what our industry and what our business is about okay so the business understanding that many of us have accumulated over the last 10 15 years is actually very very important okay and if i'm able to translate that into how we actually manage uh, automation how we actually manage uh you know uh, business process okay uh, that that actually becomes part of our value add to uh, the company okay and um you know same thing okay so so in terms of a couple of uh, other thoughts behind this right uh, we have to think about uh, you know what what do we want to do okay so on one hand uh, for the companies uh, for the smes uh, 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 we have to think about moving up the value chain right it's no longer about just low cost competition but uh, how do we add new products and services uh, in order to become more effective okay and and to and to be competing beyond just uh, low cost um, uh, co competition okay and on the other hand uh, you know this this article was written uh, uh, because of covid okay when we have less in a way we have less physical experience now so we don't go to the shops so much we don't sit in the restaurant so much right and therefore in cases like this what does it mean uh, you know for for the future of work right or for how we track you know um, business process okay or how do we track or improve efficiency when uh you know when we are less focused on the um, physical ambience okay uh ambience and uh we we need to actually improve on you know our operating efficiency you know uh, such as delivery such as e-commerce uh, and, and the digital marketing in order to be uh, successful as companies okay so when we start thinking like that uh, then actually we realize that actually behind all these changes in business process behind all this uh, use of digital marketing behind all this uh, improving of uh, operating efficiencies we need people who understand how the business works okay so it's not just about understanding technology okay it's also about translating the value 
of our experience and combining that with our own uh, technology understanding in order to manage and you know um, help uh, implement this for our businesses. Okay, so with that, I have uh, come to the end of my presentation. All right, uh, let me see, take a quick look at the chat to see whether there are questions. Okay. All right. Okay, so could you give a brief description, brief explanation that differentiates between digitalization and digitalization, digitization, and okay, I think the question is, what's the difference between digitization and digitalization? Okay, yeah. <laughs> it is a mouthful to <laughs> to pronounce without um, without uh, uh, stammering. Okay, I, uh, but basically, uh, digitization is basically converting, uh, for example, words right into digital form. Okay, so if we scan. A piece of paper okay and then it converts the text on the piece of paper to you know to a pdf or into a word document uh, then that is a digitization and this digitalization is basically making our operations into uh, uh you know in into uh you know into a more transformation type type of uh, of uh, a business process okay so generally that's that's how how it is uh, uh defined Okay, let me move down. How do you think industries in international trade of physical goods slash commodities can benefit from tech advancements? Given that trade finance operations and businesses business processes are still mainly following standards of the past. Okay, that's a that's a huge question in itself. Um, uh, trade and you know trade and trade finance uh, shipping. Uh, I I've done topics like that. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to talk. Just, just on those single, in, you know, just on those industries. But in a nutshell, um, uh, there's a lot of talk about using collaboration platforms. There's a lot of companies that are trying out collaboration platforms. There are companies that are trying out blockchain, uh, you know, uh, on a proof of concept basis. So a lot of the banks are now using uh, blockchain for proof of concept uh, for the trade finance, uh, especially when when you have a lot of fraud. Uh, uh, if you look at what happened uh, recently with some of the fraud, um, you know, uh, in in the trading uh, of commodities, uh, you know, and that's when people talk about needing to track and trace, okay, uh, their their physical products, okay, and and blockchain is one of the technologies, IoT uh, sensors is one of the technologies that people are looking at uh, as ways to track, um, you know, the the, the commodities uh, space. Uh, this question or comment is from uh, Karin. Okay, dear Prof, I think the key takeaway for Encyclopedia Britannica is that while the demise has taken 20 years, this period represents only 8% of its lifetime. So instead of thinking that companies have, I'm just reading out loud, okay, I don't know what, what you're asking right until I finish reading. So instead of thinking that companies have time for transformation, it's quicker for companies to comprehend that they only have a very short time frame for transformation. Even though it may seem like 30 years, similarly for e-commerce, 30 years compared to the entire history of commerce and trade is very uh, minuscule. Okay, great. And so as SMEs with limited exposure understanding, even while embarking on their own digital transformation journeys, how do we future proof our transformation a little bit ahead of the curve? All right, so, so there are actually two uh, questions uh, behind it. Uh, one is a comment, right? And the other one is kind of a question. Um, and and uh, thanks for that. I think thanks for writing <laughs> such a long <laughs> comment and question. Okay, so thanks, thanks, Karim. Um, I I think that uh, I think you are right to say that uh, if we look at it in 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 the full spectrum of things, uh, you know, um, the impact comes very fast. Okay. Uh, what what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, you know, uh, what I'm trying to say is that in the context of our career, okay, or in the context of a company's, uh, you know, of a career of 20, 30 years, or a company lifespan, okay, uh, there is time to adapt, okay? Of course, if you look at the whole industry itself, then it's relatively quick, as you say, okay? So it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything, okay? Um, and, and wait till the last minute. 
But what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, there is time to adapt, okay, which is the hope, okay, and the encouragement that we have that uh, just because it doesn't happen overnight, we have time to adapt. But if we don't start adapting, okay, so, but the other flip side of that is if we don't start adapting now, okay, in 15 years time, it will be too late. Okay, because what you see with e-commerce and retail now, the impact is so huge that, uh, you know, they are not able to handle it if they didn't start early. But if, if the retail has started earlier with the e-commerce and then by the time this period hits, they would, you know, have more um, capability to, to respond. Right. So it doesn't mean that we wait till 15 years later to start. Okay. But if we start in baby steps now, uh, we'll be much better prepared um, for the future. And I think that's very much the same case for the SMEs. Uh, both the big companies and SM SMEs, uh, many of them are really uh, just trying to um, uh, taking proof of concept, doing pilot projects as a way to test and see what is the cost benefit. And then they start to roll out in bigger, uh, bigger scale. Okay, so, so um, really uh, the, the key thing in this case is probably to start and, and, and uh, get a sense of how it works and then to adapt from there and make continuous improvements. Okay, I think, uh, let me take, uh, Amber, how much time do we have for questions? I think we can take one last question. Okay, let me take one last question then. All right, uh, I'll take one last question for Karine, okay. Um, even referencing the industry tr digital transformation roadmaps, it appears like the roadmaps only make suggestions of immediate short runway future between one to five years without any reference to middle transformation options within five to ten years. So it seems like the transformation roadmap does not carry any future forethought. Okay, I think, I think uh, the digital transformation uh, it is debatable, okay, uh, you know, what, what is the time frame uh, that we are looking at. Uh, I'm not familiar with all the transformation roadmaps, uh, to be honest, but I've seen some of them. Uh, and I think that there is reference to both short, sort, sort of uh, short-term and long-term initiatives. You know, whatever the case, I think whenever we are looking at our own uh, business uh, process uh, transformation or our own digital transformation, uh, initiatives, uh, you know, one of the things I always ask, um, you know, to my executives, right, and, and, and to my classes, um, you know, think about your short-term and long-term technology roadmap. So your short-term technology roadmap is what do you want to implement in the next two to three years, okay? And, and I have to say that the short-term is important for, for, one red, for one particular reason, okay? First of all, uh, not everybody believes in transformation. Right, so we need to show results, and you know, and uh, we need to have a certain low hanging fruit that we look at in the next one, two years, two, three years. Okay, and and that that um, low hanging fruit and that short term uh, business process uh, improvement, uh, we do need to look at. Okay, on the other hand, we should also think about you know our five year plan and our ten year plan. Okay, um, of course, for many companies, uh, is it is very hard to predict beyond five years. Okay, so what, you know, uh, you know, we may no longer be there, we may, you know, we may be in a different job function, right? So not many companies would think beyond that, okay? But if we think about a technology roadmap, uh, we should have a short-term initiative, we should have mid-term, okay? What do we want to achieve in the medium term? And what do we want to do uh, 10 years or 15 years down the road, okay? When we predict that the industry would change, okay? So... So there are different levels of transformation uh, that we should look at, okay? Um, and not forgetting that uh, we need to show short-term results and that actually you becomes an impetus to drive uh, other changes down the road. But at the same time, we cannot ignore the long-term, okay? And the long-term, uh, you know, so just to give an example, right? A short-term would be uh, things like uh, automation or robotic process automation or uh, use of collaboration platforms, sharing economy. Um, stuff that you can see the cost benefit analysis more quickly, okay? A longer term or mid mid term might be something like 3D printing, okay? Because the technology is, uh, you, know, um, you know, still in the stages of maturing, okay? Blockchain, for example, could be a mid term or long term uh, uh, solution, okay? When it comes to trade finance, uh, there was a question earlier about trade finance. Uh, a lot of proof of concept right now on 
on use, use of blockchain, but those are five years or beyond type of initiatives because you know, it takes a long time to get the whole ecosystem onto the same blockchain, right? So those are easily long-term initiatives over a 10-year period, okay? So we do need to look at um, various stages like this. And if you look at how companies think about the segmentation, normally it is like a 40-40-20, okay? So 40% is easily on, on short-term and then 40% on medium-term and only 20% on long-term. All right, so... Um, uh, I'm done for now. Okay. Uh, thank you okay. very much. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Go. Thank you, Prof. Go, for the session. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the session so far. Now, I uh, would like to invite Ms. Marilyn Tan from Skill to share more about the offerings at Skill. Uh, if you would like to find, if you are keen to find out more. So maybe over to Marilyn, please. Okay. I'll stop share. Thank you, Prof. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm from NUS Scale. I just wanted to share some of my uh, benefits uh, to all of you here as a working adult. Let me just move this. So NUS Scale is dedicated to lifelong learning. We are launched in June 2016. We are the one of the youngest school in NUS. We oversee, uh, you know. Uh, how we can help in the national development needs to ensure and provide high quality industry relevant education and training. That means to say that we, we are trying to help you and the organizations to be equipped with latest knowledge and skills. You know that we are advancing towards digital economy. Uh, I think it's of no surprise to you that we are having a lot of masters and uh, for people who are grads or even a stackable specialist certificates for engineering, computing, if you are already a, a, a diploma grad and so on. The latest thing that we have um, since we are started in 2016, we have actually a lot of short courses uh, or even modular courses if you are keen uh, to be funded under SSG funding. It's in the next slide. Let me just brief bring you uh, to my slide. Uh, one of the relevant short course would be Intro to Industry 4.0. It's a two-day basic course. The fee is uh, usual at 1009 but if you are Singaporean 39 and below, you are getting subsidized of 70%. So you only pay 30, you only submit your uh, payment for 30% and you can still use your skills future 500 to offset from the 570. If you are above the age of 40, you only pay 190. This is before GST and so forth. Of course, this is, um, you know, as per SSG funding requirements, you need to enter all these details in when you submit through online. You may be uh, keen to uh, take a look at my MSc Industry 4.0, which is uh, Prof. Go's uh, uh, Masters of Science uh, for NUS. I just didn't want to take up too much time and explain everything, but it is a, a very... Um, robust uh, MSc where you can actually go on certain certificates throughout the two to three years and stack them up to be a master's in, at the end of the day. So we also have industry consultancy and application project for the six months to end off. Uh, it's very tough to digest all this at this moment. So if you can, please uh, drop us a line at ask.scale at nus.edu.sg or uh, call us 6601-8888 and we'll be more than uh, happy to share more information with you. Um, and that is all for my presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, PMO's Office Smart Nation, Amber, for inviting us to uh, scale at NUS. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you so much. So um, thanks again, one, uh, everyone, for joining us to this afternoon. So um, lastly, let us know what you think about today's session through, by doing a short survey through this QR code. And the video link will be available to, um, will be hosted on our YouTube channel at Smart Nation by next week. So if you have, um, you have missed part of it, you're welcome to view the video next week on our Smart Nation Together channel on YouTube. So please help us to do the survey. Thank you once again and uh, have a good day ahead. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye.